Please, everyone, with a great round of applause, welcome Dr. Yunus to the podium. Thank you. Let me see if I can find this. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Well, I'm very happy that I get this uh, quick chance to meet you. Uh, Naila has been telling me, and then uh, Armand came over, and uh, we discussed what you're doing. And it excited me, because that's the kind of thing I like, what you're doing. And you may have some idea what uh, I, I did and what I've been doing. And briefly, I'll introduce that and uh, tell you what the current things that I'm involved with. Uh, the reason uh, people uh, remember me uh, in the activities they're involved with because I kind of bump into doing things which uh, other people don't want to get anywhere near. And I do funny things. Uh, and one of the funny things I did is to uh, try to lend money to poor people. Everybody thought it's so crazy to do something like that uh, because who wants to give a loan to a poor person? Uh, and I was uh, struggling with the idea because of the loan sharking that goes on uh, with the poor people. So I thought uh, some way I can replace the loan sharking by g doing a decent banking with them. Uh, it didn't come out like that uh, exactly. All I did is to replace the loan sharks by lending money myself. So I thought this is one way to uh, avoid the uh, terrible uh, uh, misery they cause to the people. So it worked and that gave me the idea may I sh maybe I should continue. So I tried to uh, persuade the local bank so that they can uh, and lend the money to the poor people, but they re immediately refused that. It's impossible, you cannot do such a thing. So that's where it all began. And the uh, only quality I had at that time probably was that uh, I was too stubborn. I would not give it up. <laughs> I, have not, I don't know anything about banking, I have no idea about it. And uh, I started uh, in a way uh, I thought it would work for people. Uh, it will ma make easy for people to do that. And it worked, uh, lending money to poor people. And then uh, since bank, even after my guarantee, that I, I, be, I became a guarantor uh, to let them lend money. I said, if they don't pay back, I'll pay back. Uh, but the bank, as it started growing, bank gets very reluctant. They said, the, uh, the whole thing will collapse and he will not give the money. So uh, they get very worried, and I thought maybe I should create a separate bank to do the work. So that is the process which led me to creation of this uh, new bank called Grameen Bank or Village Bank uh, to lend money to the villagers, uh, the poor villagers in the uh, country. And it worked, and it was very simple. It was not a very complicated thing. Uh, all I have to do whenever I needed a uh, way to um, figure out how to do it the right way, I just look at the conventional banks, how they do it. After all, they are in this business for a long time. So once I learn how they do it, all I have to do is do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> Uh, to give you some example, the, uh, the conventional banks love to give money if you have lots of money already. So the uh, richer you are, the more attracted they are to you. We reverse that principle. We said the less you have, the more attractive you are to us. If you have nothing, you get the highest priority from us. So this is just a reversal of what the conventional banks do. And conventional banks in Bangladesh particularly want to lend money to men. So if you look at their portfolio of all the clients, almost 99% of the clients are men, hardly 1% women. So we reversed it. We said we focus on women. And as a result, we have now 97% of our borrowers are women. And uh, 
Today we have 8.3 million borrowers in that bank, and overwhelmingly women, 97%. Conventional banks are owned by rich people, so we reverse that. We said this bank will be owned by poor people, and to boot, poor women. So we made the borrowers of the bank as the owners of the bank. So all these women in the uh, bank, they are the real owners of the bank. The bank lends out over one and a half billion dollar a year, and this bank is owned by poor people of Bangladesh, poor women of Bangladesh. So again, a reversal. Conventional banks try to do business in city center. Uh, they have the biggest building, uh, biggest office in the right in the business district of the city. This is the traditional way. We reversed it. We said we will have our offices in the rural areas where nobody goes. There's no other office except your office. So that's another one. Conventional banks want to do business in their office. If you want to do something, you have to come to their office, wait in line and down the counter or see the manager. If you're lucky, you can see that. We reversed that. We said people should not come to the bank. Banks should go to the people. So when you hear about microcredit, hear about Grameen Bank, that's the banking we do. We don't do business in our offices. We do banking at the doorstep of the people. So imagine doing banking with 8.3 million people at their doorstep. How much work it may, means and how many people you need to contact this 8.3 million people. And our whole work is done in a weekly cycle. In other words, we come to you every week on a fixed time, on a fixed day. And we meet all these 8.3 million borrowers of Grameen Bank within one week at their doorstep. Makes our life quite tough. When it rains heavily, Bangladesh is a monsoon country, it rains very, very heavily. No stoppage, because that's where the banking is. You have to go and do the job. Uh, or if it is uh, scorching heat of uh, summer, you can't wait. Or it's a very stormy day. You can't wait. Or it's a Ramadan, you're fasting. You can't wait. You have to go and do the job. And this is how the whole bank is done. And uh, you can go on and on and see, list all the things they do opposite. So two things I draw attention. One, I didn't know anything about banking. But I created a bank. And we do everything people, the conventional banks do in an opposite way. So doing in opposite way doesn't mean that it, it's something you, you trash it out, it's nothing. Something happens, you may come out with a brilliant thing just by doing it opposite. Not knowing is not a problem. Not knowing can be a blessing. Because knowing may be a wrong knowing. So if you don't know, your mind is still clear. So you can start something on your own, with thinking in a new process. You start from zero and create it up. So this is the thing that I do and it became known as microcredit, tiny loans. Tiny loans to the extent, first loan in Bangladesh, in Grameen Bank, would be something like $30, $35. And then you become bold, you want to take $50 loan, you challenge yourself, maybe I can do that. And you dare to take that $50 loan and move on. So this is how it is done. Where does the money come from? We don't take money from the government. We don't take money from the donors. We don't take money from the World Bank. We don't take money from anybody. All the money comes from within the system. As a bank, we take deposits from people, just like any other bank would do, and take this depositor's money and lend it to the poor people. And we get plenty of deposits. All this money that we have comes from depositors. An interesting part of that story is, bulk of this money comes from the borrower themselves. Because according to Grameen Bank's principle, every borrower from the day one as she joins Grameen Bank. She has to start with 
a savings account. She has to open a savings account with the bank. And she has to deposit even a tiniest possible money, if she doesn't have any money, find an absolutely a tiny, tiny little money to put it in the bank. But you must, every week. No week should go blank. So they, it became a habit with them. And over years, this tiny savings become bigger and bigger and bigger. Today, if you put all the savings of all the borrowers put together, this is nearly a billion dollar of their savings. Imagine the borrower who take $25 loan, $50 loan, collectively they mobilize its savings of nearly a billion dollars. So money is not our problem, we have plenty of money. So sometimes we tell the others, don't bring the money now because we have plenty of money. Uh, we have to find a way how to lend this money to other poor people. Let's wait, Let me, let's get some more poor people to take this money. So this is how it has worked out. And in the process, I created a lot of other companies to address the problem the people face. And one of the uh, company that uh, I could briefly mention is a renewable energy company. Because Bangladesh is an uh, energy starved country, we don't have much of electricity, not even in the city, it's very unreliable electricity. And forget about electricity in the rural areas. In Bangladesh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the situation similar to Bangladesh, uh, over 85% of people live in the rural areas, in the villages. Hardly 15% live in the cities, all the cities put together. And the rural areas don't have any electricity, meaning people don't have any electricity. Almost 70% of the people have no access to any electricity anywhere. Only privileged 30% have access and very unreliable electricity. So we thought instead of grumbling about it, we should do something about it. And what can a citizen do to do that? I have no big empire of my own. All I can do is to try it out in a small way. So in a small way, we tried to bring electricity in the villages by introducing renewable energy, solar energy. So we bought the solar panel and put it up in a solar uh, home system and install it in a house and let him pay for it because we whatever we do nothing is free everything has to be paid for it was so difficult to convince people to pay for such a thing they said, why who knows what this electricity is how long it is going to survive because they never seen it before so it was a hard time to sell this home system 15 years back when you began but we never gave up. As I said, it was a very stubborn thing. So we, once we take something, we keep pushing, keep coming up with ideas which make it work. And we uh, selling even five solar home system for a whole month was such an impossible target to achieve. But gradually we did that. We achieved five, ten, twenty per month. Today we sell more than 1,000 solar home system per day. Every day we sell solar home system, more than 1,000 pieces. So more than 1,000 homes get electrified on the renewable energy in a business way uh, in Bangladesh. Right now we have over 600,000 homes with solar home system. And by the end of the year, we'll have more than a million solar home system already installed in Bangladesh and all paid for. It's nothing free, people love it, people line up for this, and we continue to do that. So we created many such companies to solve specific problem in healthcare, in information technology, in communication, in uh, uh, garment, textile, and so on and so forth. But none of these companies, we have, I have created more than uh, 50 such companies, but in none of these companies I own a single share. And when people know that I have created so many companies, they look at me, oh, you must be a very rich man. You have so many companies. These are all big companies, some of them nationwide companies. And I have to tell them, look, I don't own these companies. I don't even own a single share of these companies. The people get very puzzled. Why do you create all these companies if you're not owning it? If you're not making money out of it? I said, 
That idea of making money never crossed my mind. I was so focused in solving problems. So that was uh, something that I was uh, involved with, how to solve problem in a business way, not making money for myself. After repeatedly saying this, I thought <clears throat> this is one type of business which is missing in the world. In our thoughts, in our theoretical framework, maybe that's the problem, that's the cause which created all the problem. Because we have only one kind of business, business to make money. And wherever people get involved with business, they want to ask themselves how much money I'm going to make out of it. I said that may be one question, but there could be some other question too. And that question is never asked, never uh, even discussed in the classroom, in the textbooks and so on. If I make money, I make myself happy. The more money I make, the more happy I get. That's the whole idea. I said, what about if I make, I can make myself happy by making other people happy. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. I get happy when I make other people happy. But that aspect is not included in business. Why not? Because after all, it's, if it is about happiness, money brings happiness, I can understand. So I'm pleasing myself. I make myself happy by making money. But I can also make myself happy by making other people happy. Why should I miss, it out, miss out on that one? And then I started talking about this kind of business. is business to make other people happy. And in the process, making me happy. And I started giving it a name, call it social business. Business to solve problems. Without any intention of making any, even a single penny out of it. So it's a non-dividend company to solve a social problem. And I started doing more and more of that. To do what kind of problem? We started doing it on our own. We created several companies. I'm not going to elaborate on that one. Then suddenly I meet someone in Paris who happens to be the chairman of Danone. Danone is a big company in France. It's a yogurt company or a milk company, milk product company. All, works all over the world. So during the discussion, I told him, why don't we create a social business in Bangladesh with you? He said, okay, we'll do that. And I said, it will be a social business. He says, what is a social business? So I explained that in this business, you will never make a money. Then why should I do the business? He sa I said, you will be solving a problem. What is the problem? Problem of malnutrition among the children of Bangladesh. If you can come up with a solution to that, then we can create that company. He said, of course, I would like to do that. So he shook hands with me. It's done. Then I crossed my mind, probably he didn't understand my English <laughs> because I'm speaking Bangladeshi English, he speaks his French English, in between we got lost. So he just said yes, yes to everything I said. I said must be something, businessmen never agree so quickly, particularly when you're creating a new business in some country he never visited, never known about. So I said I, I'm in the wrong kind of understanding. So as I came out of this lunch, we were having lunch together, I sent him a long email explaining what I said and what he agreed. And I said, if you think I have uh, understood it wrong way, tell me, it's okay with me. Within an hour, I get the reply. I understood every word of it and I reconfirm and I want to do that. So out of that came a new company in Bangladesh as a social business company called Grameen Danone Company. We produce yogurt with all kinds of micronutrients which are missing in the children which make them malnourished. Vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, all put into it and made it very delicious. Children love it. It's very cheap so that every, every child can afford it, if their family can afford it. All it needs, two cups of yogurt for during whole week. Within a week, if two cups of yogurt is eaten by a child, the child starts growing just like a normal child. His mental growth becomes normal. His physical growth becomes normal. And within eight months, he has completed all the requirement of nutrition and so on, becomes a healthy child. 
So now many, many children are buying this, their families buying it, improving their health. But again, the owners of the company, the Danone and the Grameen, do not want to take a penny out of this company because this is a social business, business to solve problems. This is how we do it. Another company called Veolia, another French company, is one of the largest uh, water company in the world. They came to me from Paris, flew to me, saying we would like to do a social business with you on water. So I gave them a lot of tough questions, a lot of tough conditions. If you want to do social business, these are the parameters that you have to fulfill. They worked very hard and finally said, yes, we can do that. So we signed the agreement and we created a water company. Bangladesh has a serious problem of water. Many of you may know, may be familiar with this kind of problem. Our surface water is extremely polluted. And our underground water is contaminated with arsenic, with poison. So people are kind of double jeopardy. Cannot drink the groundwater, cannot drink the surface water. And people become sick. People are dying. It's arsenic contamination causing deaths, cancer, skin problems, and so on and so forth. So we created this company to bring clean water to the villages in a social business way. In a charity way, you can bring water, give everybody. What happens? You do it once, you do it twice, and you run out of money. Then it stops. But if you do it in a business way, it goes on and on and on. And I keep reminding people that charity dollar has only one life. It goes out, it never comes back. It does the job, and a good job. But if you can transform that work, into social business, then social business dollar, social business dollar has endless life. It recycles again and again and again, doing the same job over and over and over. So you get much more mileage out of the dollar if you convert this into social business dollar. So we created that business, social business, Grameen Biolia, and we started creating many more. I was invited uh, by the chief operating uh, chief CEO of uh, uh, Adidas. Everybody knows Adidas in their headquarters in Germany. So he said, "I read your book, and I'm very interested in. First, I'm intrigued by your idea about social business, but I'm I want to understand more fully what it is." so that we would like to do something about it. How do we begin, for example, Adidas? How do we begin a social business? Where do we start? I said, maybe you start with the mission statement. He said, like what? I said, something like, nobody in the world should go without shoes. As a shoe company, it's our responsibility to make shoes affordable to even to the poorest person. So he almost got shocked to look at me in the blank eyes. That's a big task. Then I looked at him, I said, Adidas is a big company. <laughs> Why should you take a small task? If you want to take a task, take a big task. He said, I'll have to talk to my colleagues. I cannot do it myself. I said, take your time, no rush. You invited me and I gave my idea what it is. So he spent about three hours while his staff, one of his staff giving me a tour of the whole campus, this beautiful place with the museums and things. And during lunchtime we got together again, his uh, colleagues and myself, and the CEO was sitting next to me. He said, um, my colleagues asked me to ask you how cheap the shoes should be in order to be affordable to the poorest people. I said, you got me there. I said, well, okay, maybe under one euro. How does it sound? He said, you are a very tough man. <laughs> I said, I'm not tough. The issue is tough. And you are the one who can address it. Nobody else can do that because you have the technology of it. So he took another two hours again to discuss with his colleagues, this time about the pricing. And in the end, he had met me with his colleagues and said, we uh, may want to make an announcement that we want to do a social business to produce shoes for poor people, affordable for them, 
and we'll try to make it under one euro. We cannot promise, but we'll try our best. And they worked for two years, designed that shoes, tested it in Bangladesh, designed and uh, get their feedback. Everybody loved that shoes. It priced under one euro. And that's, again, another social business. You have to be sustainable. If you do it as a charity, okay. You, it costs $5, but I give you $1. Then that's not a social business. Social business has to be a sustainable business. So this is what we want to do. So we did lots of those kind of things, and we are hoping, oh, we are hoping that more and more people will get in. Now the Japanese companies are coming uh, to set up social business for Bangladesh, and also in Japan themselves. And German companies, European companies, American companies and so on. So this is the idea of how to solve problems. We get overwhelmed by the problems, but we don't realize that we have enough power to solve those problems. And particularly young people like you has enormous capacity, enormous creativity to address those things. And if you do that, it can be done. Again, I am doing the reverse, if you notice. Businesses are done for profit. I reversed it. We do business not to make profit for ourselves. Company makes profit, profit stays with the company. I don't want to take this money because I want to make sure that this business solves the problem. Once you delink from the profit, suddenly a whole new world emerges in front of you. Very exciting world that I can change people's life. I can change the whole world. I have the power and that power is in our hand. We, are, we, have, we can use it. And if you use it, we don't have the problem that we see around us. So that's the basic idea. We, last point I'll make, or information I'll give, we are having our third social business summit in Vienna on November 10, 11, and 12. So you're all invited. There are a lot of young people who will come from around the world. A lot of business CEOs, like the CEO of Danone, CEO of Adidas, CEO of uh, Otto, CEO of uh, Uniqlo, and many such CEOs. These are all very top companies of the world. They will also come. They did in the past two other uh, social business summit. So this will be an exciting gathering, and you can see, you can listen, you can hear what to do, how to proceed, and what's in future. Thank you, and I'll stop here, and if there's any question, probably I can take a few questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One, one Professor, Professor Yunus, thank you. You surprised us, and we have a little surprise from you from really next, next, next generation. Oh. <laughs> I guess. Hello. Yes, 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 hold it high, hold it high. Come on, give it to you. Yeah. Do you want to do something? Yeah, sure, sure. Ah, there you go. There.